So hi, this is uh, me. I'm going to talk to you about Windows 10. New Windows, new tools. And um, that's me. You can find me at all those places. So the management story on Windows has been interesting. It's been, I don't want to say uneven. It hasn't been. It has gotten better and better and better and better. I mean, yes, it, we had to pry XP out of a lot of people's cold, dead hands. But the fact of the matter is that if we go to the most malign Windows at this point still is Vista. Vista gave us some great stuff. I mean, the Panther setup engine, which is that thing we've had through Vista and Windows 7 and Windows 8 and whatever. How many of you have looked at automated de deployment tools like MDT? Or maybe you're doing some stuff with System Center? Okay, smarter than me. I've not learned, I've not learned Config Manager yet. Um, and those things just keep getting better. PowerShell has just been an, an, an amazing. It's just, don't get me started. Um, no, seriously, now, in the new, now a new product comes out from Microsoft, I'm like, where are the PowerShell commandlets? What, 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 what do you mean there are no commandlets? Don't make me call Jeffrey Snover. I have his email. The big thing, though, is everything that you know works. If you have a, some VB script that does WMI stuff, to get something done for you, convert it to PowerShell. But if you don't do that, it's still going to work, you know. Here's the big stuff, though. There is a big, big, big story that you might know, but I'm going I'm to go over it anyway. There's a reason why the cloud's a big thing. And it's a very simple reason, and I think it's going to work. I mean, basically, th there's a basic problem we're going to talk about that is selling Windows in the first place I, that I think is the thing that's driving this stuff. So it's going to be, you're going to hear lots of cloud stuff, you're going to hear lots of MDM. I know you've been hearing it. Mobile device management and MAM, mobile application management. You know what that means? It means that I think we're seeing the beginning of the last days of group policy, which would be sad, because you would be clapping. Come on. <laughs> on April 24th, 2003, we got the result and set of policies uh, analysis wizard and group policies, and I've had no problem with it since. So. Also, there's a, there's a new thing, it's not a new thing, it's an old thing in the Unix world, Unix, Linux world, but uh, and it, they've, it's been nibbling it around the edges of Windows, but most of us don't deal with them, and that's package managers. When we think of package managers, you probably think of the one that you should be able to get with SMS. I don't know if it's still in, in, in Config Manager. This is a different animal, different animal. It's a different approach to deploying software. We'll have some tools about that. Um, but before we get started, I know you all have the same question about Windows 10. I know you really came here for me to answer one question. Why isn't it Windows 9? <laughs> Am I wrong? So, I don't know. I believe I've discovered the answer, but I've found a lot of speculation. The first one, and this, this occurred to me very early one morning, made perfect sense. It's Windows 9, but they use the numeric base of 9. If you can actually laugh at that, you're way too geeky because you remember like <laughs> number bases and binary and stuff like that. I think partly it may be the international market. In Germany, it would be Windows 9. That, <laughs> that's not going to work. <laughs> that's not going to work. You got to do this with a, with a bad William Shatner voice. Must break curse of the even numbered windows. You know, so. <laughs> it's possible. I particularly like this one. Um, oh, this is mine. I think they do it to distract Gartner because when Windows 8 came out, I could live with this, the start screen. I could live with it. What I didn't like was the fact that there, it was like, you'd say all apps, if you've, ever done, if you've never done this, what happens is you say all apps and they get small and you, there's a little slider that goes like this, not like this. And you're like the president flying over a disaster area after, you know, you're like looking at the wreckage. And we've had a hierarchy in the way we ar arrange icons since the friggin' program manager in Windows 3 or 2 or something like that. So we still don't have that. That troubles me just a tiny bit. Fortunately, I can launch all of my applications from PowerShell. So. <laughs> The most frequent rumor, though, and a lot of people swore to me that this is absolute truth. I know that it's not. But there is a reference to a version of Java, I believe it is, that when it's in, it, in its installer, it says that if it sees Windows 9 anything, that it assumes it's like 
Windows 98 and it refuses to run. That's absolutely not true. It is absolutely not true and there needs to be a Snopes page on it because so many people believe it's true. But I believe I've discovered the reason why. Okay, ready? You and I think that versions increment in an arithmetic way. But I would argue that Windows is so good that it grows exponentially. And here's how it works. <laughs> this version doesn't increment by one. No. It grows by 17% every time. And then you round it. What, what, what's that? You don't believe me? Look, Vista, Vista was Windows 6 which rounds to six. You could actually start from XP, which is 5.1, and this still works. <laughs> Multiply that, you get 7.02, which rounds to seven. Eight then becomes 8.2, rounds to eight. Ah, but that, 9.6, rounds to 10. <laughs> so that's the facts, Jack. Okay. All right, big things to know. Um, and I, I apologize, when I was asked to put this talk together, no one told me anything about what was going to be in the keynote, okay? So if you hear some things that might have been like in a keynote or maybe like one of the, the overview talks, sorry. So, anyway, so um, anyone from uh, Windows 7, as a matter of fact, I, I, I heard yesterday, because I asked about this, how many of you are running Vista? Oh, come on. No love for Vista. All right, okay. you can upgrade. <laughs> Apparently the... I asked them if they tested it. Do they have any copies of Vista around left to actually test it with? And I guess someone did. So Everybody gets to upgrade free for a year. Now, that's interesting, isn't it? First of all, uh, Enterprise doesn't count, but I'm, I'm sure none of you run Enterprise Windows. So, no, it's all about your contracts, right? You're gonna, you are going to get the, the, the upgrade anyway. But you have like a year to upgrade, which is interesting. Because you see what they're doing. And they're also saying you can upgrade pirated copies. They don't care if you got something that was cranked out from some factory in China, you know? Then works just fine. Because they want to get everybody under the tent. The year is the interesting thing. Because if you think about it, I mean, remember, 14 January of 2020, what, what, what's that day? That's the day Windows 7 support stops. 2020. How many of you hope to be retired by then? Or 10 January of 2023. That's when, that's when support for eight. So Microsoft is going to support seven and eight for a long, long time. If you're feeling the pressure, the gun to your head, don't. Five more years for Windows 7 and eight more years for Windows 8. You've got lots and lots and lots of time. I'm not saying don't do it. I'm just saying that it, you can get excited when you're in these talks. You're like, everybody's doing it. I don't want to be the only one that's just running that Windows 7. You know? So don't sweat that. Also, and I really, really like this. The Microsoft perspective has always been, you go to Dell and you, or HP or any of the gold, premium, platinum, and uranium sponsors, okay? And <laughs> I forgot to say something, sorry. I don't work for Microsoft. No, seriously, none of this may be true, okay? Because first of all, they've kind of got the cloud fever with the way that they're building Windows 10. I think that even if clouds fail tomorrow, the coolest thing about clouds is the way they've changed software. If you stop and think about it, if, if I work on the server team, in my heart I'm a server guy more than a desktop guy. I've done a lot of desktop support stuff. I love desktop geeky stuff, but I've been a server guy for a long time. So if I were on the server team and I had some great idea and I said to my manager, I want to do this. This is back in the, the two-year cycle world. He or she would say, you got 18 months to get it done. Well, if I slip a day and I'm 18 months in a day, too bad, we got to throw it away and wait for, for two more years. In Azure, there's no official numbers for this because Azure isn't one thing, it's a lot of things. But if I were to say to you they build a new Azure every two weeks and roll it out across the world, I'm not that far off. What does that mean? That means some fascinating, cool stuff happens. There's this, this yeasty, frothy kind of environment where you're allowed to build new stuff, try it out, learn tremendously. It's called break the network on a regular basis. Or it's got a, you know, it's got a, no, really, there is a, there is a de among developers, there's this meme of it. Now, and I'll give you some examples. How many of you do server? Server 2012, anybody, uh, part of your job? Okay. All that great stuff came from Azure. The storage replication comes from Azure. There are so many interesting ideas in Windows as well. So, I mean, uh, so the original story was you go to 
somebody. You buy a computer, and it's already got a copy of Windows. And of course, the frustrating thing has always been, well, why do I have to buy another one? But that's not going to change, you know. And the idea was you're supposed to flatten it, take the OEM image off, and then put your enterprise image on, which, by the way, wasn't a bad model, but we want to do other things as well, right? We, I don't know if you've looked into the Microsoft Signature stuff, but they have these PCs they call Signature PCs. You've heard of this? Microsoft is saying to vendors, sell versions of your computers with our Windows on it and none of the crapware you guys normally put on there. And Because Lord knows uh, uh, I need to spend money for, you know, semantic antivirus when Defender's pretty gosh darn good, you know, and it just keeps getting better. But anyway, so, and they will feature it on the Microsoft Store and stuff like that. So th that's, that's a great pro program, and I'm, I'm glad they're doing it. So the plan is no more flatten and reimage. The idea instead is it's upgrade and refresh. And you'll do that through Windows Update, as I told you, the new denial of service tool for the Internet. So, no, seriously, I, 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 I was looking for the laugh when I did that, but... Think about it. What happens with your Android phone? What happens with your Windows phone? What happens with your iPhone when something goes wrong? You just press both buttons and, you know, hold your leg a certain way, and it says, I'm about to forget everything, boss. Are you sure? But you're like, I think I got the pictures of, you know, until we found out that you can actually do that on an iPhone and the pictures are still there. <laughs> did, did you catch that? About nine months ago, somebody... Um, there's these places where you can recycle your phones, you know, like give them to someone who'll give them to poor people or something like that. And these people hooked up these phones, which had supposedly been reset. And uh, all the phones that guys had owned had pictures on them you just don't want to, I don't want to tell you about, you know. But so apparently the, the erasing process when you do this doesn't really work the way it should. So I guess, it, I guess if you really wanted to wipe your phone before you gave it to charity, you'd have to do the mil spec thing where you filled it with zeros and filled it with ones and filled it with zeros and filled it with ones or something along those lines. But the theory is you can reset that phone back to the way it was when you came out of the box and then you can start re-entering applications and you can start re-updating. And the thought is Windows should be like that. We've got a whiff of that in Windows 8. It's serious in Windows 10. And as I said, Windows, Windows 10 is the last Windows. It's just upgrades to Windows Update from here on in. Additionally, this is not a new idea. They've been working on this for a while, and Microsoft has, has gone down this road a few times, backed off, tried again. But if you saw Joe, Bel Joe Belfiore's uh, routine in the keynote, then you know that they've taken this notion of universal apps, which I'll talk about in a minute, considerably farther. Okay, so that's, those, are, those are the big things. So, big, big topics I want to cover with the rest of my time. Windows and Azure are going steady, and so... They see each other in a different way. But it's not unconditional love, it's conditional love, like the conditional access you heard of, and we'll talk about that. I want to briefly talk about the new ultra-modern apps. The applications that were built for Windows 8 were first called Metro apps, remember? And then you couldn't say Metro because what had happened? It was like the, uh, there's a German company, they like Walmart for Germany, Metro AG, and they're big. And they have a software piece to them, and they said, you. You can't use that. That's our trademark. And Microsoft kept using it. And, um, and then they announced Windows 8, and they were saying Metro stuff. Um, they imagined that the Germans had a sense of humor. And <laughs> it's not true. I spent a lot of time working there, and they're great guys. But, and so, <laughs> if you do this, we will sue you. <laughs> we could use the revenue. <laughs> that way, Microsoft would be writing big checks to two big European organizations, the you know, European Union and... Yeah, and Germany. So, so they became Windows 8, designs, Windows 8 design style applications. Doesn't that roll right off the tongue? But modern apps is the phrase most people use nowadays. It's a modern app. Well, these are ultra-modern apps, so we'll talk about that. The store changes. I know. Sh let me see, see again. How many of you have Windows 8 rolled out? I want to see percentage. Percentage that have Windows 8 seriously rolled out. Okay. All right. So that's 7%. Something, something like that. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. I like Windows 8. I'm just saying, many of you don't know this, but the big issue that keeps you from getting Windows 8 is these new applications are very hard to roll out. Microsoft did some goofy stuff, and they're fixing pretty much all of it. So Windows 10, if for no other reason, is... It's sort of like... Think about this. You guys laughed when I said Vista. Vista was a great operating system. It was the first 21st century operating system. It was the first operating system that really understood the, the, the security challenges of the 21st century. 
But it was marketed badly. It was tossed out on the... And the other thing, too, is it, it had the inevitable problems of it needed drivers, there weren't any apps for it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, which are problems that always solve themselves. It's just that we'd forgotten, because it had been so long since we upgraded from XP. We forgot that we should expect new applications, new operating systems not to have applications, not to have drivers, and to really run slow until the faster hardware comes out. That's normal. Windows 7 was nothing more than Vista with a paint job. People tell me, oh, Windows 7 is so much better. I say, list 20 things for me you like about Windows 7. I guarantee 18 of them came from Vista. This is that same story. Windows 8, their heart was in the right place. We live in a touchy world. We've got to be able to run Windows on touch. The answer wasn't so, wasn't so good, but what does it try? So think of Windows 8 as being that Vista, and Windows 10 as being the, the Windows 7 for, for Windows 8. PowerShell 5 brings us some stuff. One Git, that's the package manager I want to talk about, and some other new tools as well. So that's part of the official template we're supposed to use. Those things just like flicking around above us. I'm afraid they'll fall. They look sharp. I just don't. Um, so the deal is this. You are used to building a Windows box and joining a domain. You can still do that. But now you can join an active, an Azure Active Directory domain. We'll talk about that in just a minute. It's worth looking at because it's going to be a big growth area. And I believe that. That is not just Microsoft propaganda. I have a solid number that may change your mind about Azure Active Directory. This is something you need. How many of you are AD folks? That's like part of what you do. But yeah. I heard the scariest word I could hear yesterday at a presentation uh, at the Windows 10 foundational session. Windows 10 for enterprises. Did anybody see that talk? Uh, um, Jim Alcove? Anyway, so one of the project managers came out and she talked about Azure Active Directory, and she said, alternatively, you could join it to your legacy Active Directory. I said, <laughs> she used the L word. <laughs> I'm like, oh, man. So Windows 10 boxes can join uh, regular old domains, as always. That doesn't change. But you can also log onto your Azure Active Directory. Uh, and there's some, there's some benefits now. It's largely going to be more useful for de devices, things like iPads and, and Android tablets or, or uh, Surface tablets. But there are benefits for all kinds of machines, which I know leads you to say, wait a minute, Azure AD, Mark, I uh, don't know if you didn't get the, the memo, but I, we don't have those. We don't care. Um, OK, that's true. I get that. Um, but things are changing. How many of you have Office 365? See, you do have an Azure Active Directory. They create an Azure, Azure Active Directory domain. They don't call it a domain. It's called a tenant. There are, I used to know the number, really big, really big number, number of Azure Active Directory domains, which are largely, whenever you hear a number that there's 100,000 of them or a million of them, I don't know what it is, 1.4 million or something, bear in mind that the vast majority of those Azure Active Directory domains are the free ones that have already been built for existing Office 365 systems. So, that's free. It's limited to 500,000 objects in your, in your Azure Active Directory, which is probably enough space. Okay. Alternatively, if you, if you want to buy it, then basic Azure AD costs a buck a month per user, and premium is four. There's different things you could do with them. You need premium, for example. One of the cool things that you want to be able to do is use your phone as a factor of authentication to log on. In order to do that, you've got to be an Azure person. Okay. Now, I think for the basic thing, everybody gets it free. I'm sure, I'm sure everybody gets it free. But I believe that's going to change over time. So, The other wrinkle is that to make that work, you have to go to your Azure, your, your, your Azure portal. And I know for most of you, how many of you ever, have ever been on the Azure portal? Yeah, not that many. Okay, I didn't think so. Well, you, you, you go to azure.windows.com. And you log on with your Office 365 account. Or... You can go to Office 365. I would love to be demonstrating this stuff, guys, but the internet's like this, and I didn't. I don't want to be one of those guys that's standing there like, uh. So I have screenshots. Okay. I know it's cowardly. I understand, but <laughs> but it's you know it's a big network. You know? Anyway, uh, and if you if you go your Azure Active, so so start at Office 365, and you will see that one of the little tools you have is Azure Active Directory because now you have it. And so click there. It will take you to the Azure portal. You're going to log in using your Office 365 credentials. 
not your MSA account, your 365 credentials, and there will be settings. And one of the settings is enable device registration preview. Remember, the thing, big thing about Azure is that things are changing all the time. So half the stuff you're using on Azure isn't officially out yet. Honestly, I've never been burned by anything in Azure that was not officially out. But, so enable that as well. Okay. All right, so what's the point? Why would I do this? Why would I do this? Because you could join anything to an Azure Active Directory. A Windows phone, an iPhone, uh, uh, an iPad, uh, you know, yoga tablet, whatever, you know. That's the good news, you know. You authenticate in some manner. Typically, the way that you're going to do it is the Microsoft Authenticator. Does anyone use Microsoft Authenticator? For those who don't know, it's an app you can get on any of your phones. You prove who you are, and for every account it knows about you, your Office 365 account, your Microsoft account, your Hotmail account, your Outlook.com account, if it needs to validate anything, it wants to know that you are indeed you, you open the thing up, and it gives you like a, it's like a six, seven, eight-digit code that changes every 30 seconds or so. So the notion is, you've got to have that in your hand. That makes Microsoft feel like, okay, that's really Mark they're talking to. By doing that, they, they then put a certificate on the device. They put it on the phone or on the tablet or on the full-blown desktop computer. Everybody with me on this? What's the value of that? Microsoft's argument is that it's almost a second factor of authentication. And it enables pins. That's the whole point. It enables pins. So the notion is, I got a laptop here, Lenovo 230, I got a, you know, Windows phone. Yeah, I'm the guy I got. They're, they're actually quite good, by the way. Um, there are some apps I miss, but they couldn't have been that important if they weren't implemented on the Windows phone platform. <laughs> I just run my iPhone emulator on it and the other stuff. There, there, there is no iPhone emulator that I know of. So. So what's going to happen is, well, two, two things. One is, as you, know, as you know better than I do, passwords have to get more complex every year because the bad guys have got faster and faster machines. That's the first thing. The second thing is, more and more, you're not logging on with a keyboard. You're logging on with one of these little soft keyboards. And if, you're, if your Office 365 password is this long, the chances you get something wrong is pretty good, isn't it? So the notion is, once you've joined the machine to the Azure Active Directory, then it's a believable enough machine that you can simply use a pin to get into it. Which wouldn't make much sense otherwise. So. Which leads also, by, by the way, when you join the Azure Active Directory, you get conditional access. Let me talk to you about conditional access. You saw some demonstrations of it. Conditional access actually means two things, all right? Remember the demos you saw about how you're building a, you're building a document on Word that's for your enterprise? and you want to put it on your thumb drive or something like that. It's going to keep you from doing it. Or you want to paste it to Twitter. Remember that demonstration? That's conditional access. Okay. There were good demos. They didn't make clear the fact that you have to be like connected into the Azure Active Directory for that to happen. So this is one of the reasons that you're going to want to think about joining an Azure, Azure Active Directory. It also enables something else. Server 2012 R2 introduced a thing called the Web Application Proxy. Anybody play with it at all? Yeah, it's a little obscure. Here's what it does. It's a software firewall. But what it does that's different is this. It's an application by application firewall. So for example, let's say that you've got 15 line of business applications that you've built. And maybe you built them eight years ago, 10 years ago. Well, when you built them, it was all laptops and desktops inside the organization connected through the domain to your internal web server, right? And then people started dialing in, but that was a VPN. That was okay. We trusted VPNs. And besides, they were domain joint computers. Does any of this sound familiar? I hope so. What's happened in the last five, six, seven years? The thing that's given us all ulcers. BYOD, bring your own disaster, I, I'm, device. <laughs> and you know the story, somebody says, I want, I, it's a web-based app that we built here, I want to get to it through my iPad. And you're like, I can't because it's secure and stuff like that. And the guy says, you do know I'm the CEO, right? You know, so. 
And so they're trying to come up with ways to get past that. And so what the web application proxy lets you do is it lets you say, oh, this app, it's really secure. Nobody gets on there without two factors of authentication. Or you, you might say, oh, this application here, uh, it's kind of secure. If you're coming in from the intranet, just your domain password will do the job. If you want to come from outside, I'm going to need a second factor of authentication. Or maybe this application is fairly low security. You don't even have to be a known device. That's what web application proxy adds. It's a very cool thing. It's not easy to set up. You have to play with ADFS, which is, you know, the penalty for shoplifting in 13 states. And <laughs> ADFS has some, well, anyway. Um, and what they've done here is they've taken all that stuff that you don't want to have to do and put it in the cloud for you. So the other thing conditional access gives you is to be able to say things like, okay, I've got this internal app, and maybe the internal app on my premise it will support that. Maybe the internal app is inside Azure as a cloud service. Now, okay, let me ask a question. How many of you have built a cloud service in Azure PaaS and use it in your organization? Are those crickets I hear? <laughs> yeah, it's something you're not doing yet. But when you start building your own apps in the next few years, you're going to go to a cloud provider to do it, more than likely. Because it's so much, you know, I've always talked about security issues and this, that, the other thing. But the funny thing is, it's astounding how, how cheap beats secure every day. <laughs> Seriously. And the cloud has become so much cheaper that I'm, it, you, we're all moving to it, you know? So anyway. Okay. So I want to show you something here. Uh, sort of side effect of the... So here I'm going to do a who am I where I'm logged in as me, okay? And so that's me. I'm a local account. And what's that? To Sid, my, that's, my, that's my social security number as far as Windows is concerned. And what's it look like? S-1-5-21-whatever. And then that's random numbers, random numbers, random numbers. Those identify my domain, and that's my special one. Okay. What's that 1-5-21 come from? Hmm? No, 1-5-21. That's Bill Gates' father's birthday. <laughs> that's not true. But, <laughs> but I knew you'd believe it. So. No, seriously, the, the, the original idea was this is version one of the SID, and but, but with security stuff, you can come back. Just an excitable boy. I love sound guys because none of them have killed me yet, and they all want to. Um, and then it's the kind of identifiers. So before we, but then, you know, let's see how to, how to join the cloud. This changed with the new build that we got the day that uh, the tech ed, Ignite to start, started. And now this is in the setup. It says, we're now going to enroll you. And what happens is, if you run setup through the GUI, you're, there's a fork in the road where you say, are we going to join a local domain or are we going to join a domain in the cloud? And if you read that text, you can see that if you're, that you, once you go one way, it's hard to go back. It's not the end of the world. Now, there is a next page, but unfortunately, uh, you, the network has to be working, so I was not able to get a good screenshot. This is a slightly older one. You're in the system or the settings app, a settings modern app. It has a number of things on it. Now, if you want to find where, where does you, you join the cloud, you look over here, display, whatever, blah, 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 speech, and about. So you, you, do, you do system and about, and then down here it says connect to a cloud. When you do that, it says, let's get you signed in. At this point, you sign in with your Azure Active Directory account your Azure Active Directory account. Now, I believe it is still the case, but they will eventually fix it before RTM, that the way you type, type it is Azure AD, I'm sorry, in, in here you gotta type Azure AD backslash, I didn't do it here, sorry. Azure AD backslash your email address. So I, this would have worked better if I'd said Azure AD backslash boss at Manassi.com. Make sense? 
Essentially, it's like you're creating an imaginary domain called Azure AD. That's a signal to Windows 10 that we're going to the cloud. I have been told by everybody at Microsoft that they're going to clean it up before RTM and that it'll be much easier to do. Okay. Once it does that, it thinks about it for a while. And there is another modern app called the Cloud Experience Host. I believe that's what it's called. Is it Cloud Experience Host? Yes, the Cloud Experience Host. I mention this because sometimes you can join a machine. Remember, the code's not done yet. Sometimes you can join a machine to the domain, to the Azure domain, and it thinks about it for a while, and you get one of my favorite error messages. It says, something went wrong. <laughs> and it says it in big blue, like these guys, friendly letters on the white. Something went wrong. I'm sure you feel as bad about it as I do. <laughs> and there's a little button out here that says, try again. And it never works. <laughs> beta, 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 beta. Okay. But you can find out about this by going to the Cloud Experience host. Now, it's not on the Start menu by default, but you can put it on. Okay. Once you've done that, it reboots, you, boot, you log in, it says, let's set up a work pin. This is the first payoff. So what happened when you joined an Azure Active Directory domain? First of all, you were enrolled in a mobile device management tool if you have one. I'll talk about specifics, but it's basically any of the big ones out there, as well as Microsoft's in tune. You get enrolled, the policies get loaded down, whatever it is that your MDM does, all those things will happen. I know the question you have. Can I have group policies in Azure Active Directory? Sadly, no. And why? Because the general notion is that, you know, right now, if you buy a PC and stick it in an enterprise, there's about a 98% chance that it's joined to an Active Directory. It's not going to be true here, though. Clearly, we can't send group policies to an iPad or even to a Surface. So, so that creates a, a pin for you. There's, this thing wants a six-digit pin by default, but that's a policy that you, you, can, you can change. At this point, the login screen looks like this, and you have seen this before. You've seen this before because of all the demos that you've seen. It's now circular, and everyone apparently is now going to take the time to put their picture there because we've seen lots of that. And notice under sign-in options, it says key. That means password. And then there's what looks like a keypad. If you have a smart card, there's a little icon for that as well. You always have the password if nothing else works if the pin doesn't work. Once we've done that, this is the interesting part. For me, I don't get out much, you know. Oops. Come back. There we go. There's my SID. I'm Azure AD, Mark Manassi, S-1- Oh, no, not 5-21. I can't handle this much change. We look down here, and we get bunches of new groups as well. So. so what are our benefits from joining? Oops. So as I said, the Azure AD prefix should go away soon. Uh, my question was, could I join more than one Azure AD account with a machine? That might be interesting. If I were a roaming consultant kind of person, I thought it'd be kind of cool if I could you know, have different personalities on, on the machine. Uh, but you can't. You can only join one Azure AD account. My next question was, could I also join a on-premises AD account? Sorry, a legacy Active Directory. <laughs> on-premises, you can't do both. So you do the one or the other. Okay. Again, management tools, no group policies. Um, some of the system center stuff, I guess, works on some of the mobile devices. Uh, the MDM things are going to work. Intune works. Third-party stuff does as well. I say, now this is interesting. Because if you think about it, how many of you have worked with a mobile device management tool? Intune or anything like that? Okay. Like group policy lets you do this much, and mobile device management lets you do like this much. But I think the general idea is, well, we'll talk about it in a minute. But uh, if you're on-premises AD joined, then the Windows 10 box works just the way that you expect it will. It takes group policies and config manager, orchestrator, whatever it is that you use to, to manage your desktops now. So why are they doing this? So here's, 
So here's the big question. I know that we've talked, I, I know people probably talked to you about this. I have a slightly different spin on this than I think other people do, so bear with me a little bit if you would. So my, here's my first question. Um, how many of you don't have a laptop? Now in this crowd, I'd be surprised if anybody raised their hands. But if we talk to your mother or your grandfather or your 15-year-old kid, what's the chances that they don't have a laptop? Really? Like all of your kids have laptops? We're geeks, smart. Yeah. No, I, I, when I got my iPad, I love my iPad. You know, when I got my iPad years ago, I found it odd. I mean, I, I went away on, you know, for, for some fun on a weekend, and I found myself just bringing my iPad and not my Windows laptop. I, when I realized that a cold chill went down my back, because that's how I make my living, explaining how to manage Windows devices, you know. And more and more, you're going to see that that, lo that more, more, folks, more and more folks are going to be no computer people. They're going to be tablet people. They're going to be tablets with Bluetooth keyboard people or something along those lines. Those things don't run Windows. That's the weird thing. You guys don't seem to be buying this. This is interesting. No, I'm interested in that. Because I, I believe that with every year that goes by, there's going to be fewer and fewer standard laptops with screens or standard desktops with screens. We'll use them because we're knowledge workers. But unless that's your job, I think most people are going to access the web, the cloud, their, their data, just through an iPad. Now, that troubles me because it's not nearly as rich an experience. It would drive me crazy. I'm a touch typer. Typing on iPad you know, hard glass is, is not any fun at all. But I think more and more people are going to be, be doing that. And how many of you have gone to Office 365 or some other SaaS thing like Gmail or something along those lines? How many of you got that? Yeah, so people are going to the cloud, They're definitely, definitely moving to the cloud slowly, slowly. And if you're not, don't misunderstand, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with you. Because something really bad is going to happen in the cloud at some point, and you'll be the only one that's left with data. <laughs> you know what the problem is, though? The problem is the cloud keeps getting cheaper. To the point, I never imagined cloud adoption would be this fast. And I think it's just that what ends up happening is that I imagine the CEO talking to the CIO and the CEO saying, why are we not in the cloud? All of my golf buddies are in the cloud. And the CIO is saying, well, there's security and we got reliability issues and data sovereignty. And the CEO says, let me re-explain this to you. These guys are saving, our competitors are saving so much money on IT by going to the cloud that soon we are going to be the most secure company that's not in business anymore because we don't have any business. This is an interesting fact, though. Uh, an IDG study asked 2,000 organizations what they were doing with the cloud. And one of the questions they asked, the one I always want to ask is, are you hiring fewer IT people? The number of people who said that they needed fewer IT people because of the cloud was 17%. The number of people who said they needed more IT people because of the cloud was 20%. 12% of the people surveyed said they'd left the cloud and the big three reasons. Number one was security. Number two was we have to hire so many more IT people, it's so expensive. <laughs> Number three was we've got to hire, hire too many help desk people because none of the users can figure the cloud out. So. Uh, that same IDG survey showed that if, this is really interesting. And this is November 2014. I looked at it. I used to do surveys for a living. They did a good job. 16% have no on-premises IT right now, and 20% will have it by next year. One out of five organizations doesn't have any servers on staff. Doesn't have any, maybe a router or something. That's a lot, and that's fast. Those people are never going to have active directories. If Microsoft doesn't do, for, do something for these guys, somebody else is going to. So I think those, those some of the, some of the, the, the big drivers. Does that make sense? We'll do some more of that. Okay. At least we know the problem. Microsoft doesn't rule in this area. Windows, they owned the desktop world for the longest time. Now people are buying Macs, or they're not buying laptops at all. They're just doing tablety stuff. And how about the phone area? Windows phone, I love my phone. 41 megapixel camera, all that kind of stuff. And the market share on Windows phone is creeping up on other. I'll have Windows 10 on my phone, and you won't have it on your iPhone. So there. So I was saying, fewer are going to buy laptops and desktops. 
And the other thing too is they're not even number one in the cloud. Who's number one in the cloud? Amazon, AWS. Although I suspect that may not be the case in two years. I'll tell you why. Um, if you look at all the pieces of the cloud, IaaS, build virtual machines, PaaS, that's the hardest one to explain. Build an app that's kind of like an ASP.NET app, but it runs only on the cloud. But that means that it's easily stretchable. You need to triple it in size overnight, a couple of clicks will do it. You need to make it smaller, a couple of clicks will do that. I always think that that's like, the example for somebody like that has to be Sports Illustrated. Because I don't know Sports Illustrated, I'm a, I'm a geek, I don't know crap about sports, but I know this Sports Illustrated. And I know they have a website. And you've got to figure for 11 months of the year, the web, website activity is like this. I mean, you know, there's a the little bloop, you know, Super Bowl blip and the, you know, bloop, you know, March, whatever it is, madness stuff and all that kind of thing, you know. And then the bathing suit issue comes out. For those who don't know, Sports Illustrated was like back in the time and life days is when it started, like in the 50s or something like that. And this is when pornography was not available to everyone on demand. And so... But you've got to imagine the web going for like, you know, for like five weeks of the year. And, and publishing is not a particularly profitable thing nowadays, I'm told. And so having to buy enough servers for this, when you're only doing this most of the time, has to really, really chap their hide, you know. That's, that's PaaS. That's the beauty of PaaS. And then the SaaS offers a service. And you look at all the vendors. Salesforce has got a great SaaS. Uh, Amazon, terrific Infrastructure as a service, ter terrific virtual machines. Microsoft has great IaaS. I have done a number of projects with their virtual machines, and I've been surprised at how good the PowerShell support was, making it e so easy for me to do it once and push a button and zap. It's done 500 times. Just absolutely, absolutely cool stuff. PaaS, I am told, I'm not a coder in that area. The PaaS works pretty well. Um, and software as a service, I've been surprised. I went to Office 365 largely because I've been doing this for 32 years, and in the 90s, I had a staff of like 50 people. But as time's gone on, the web changed things, and every year I needed fewer and fewer people, and I realized I was running an exchange server for me, you know, and some of my associates, but still. And I, I didn't want to do that. Went to Office 365, I expected all kinds of things to go wrong. It's been nothing but good news. Nothing but good news, and it's dirt cheap. They, they took the small business package, which is what I had. I just wanted exchange. I didn't care about that other crap, you know. And... It went to business essentials, still $5 per user per, per, per month, and there's all these cool things. I've always wanted to play with SharePoint, but I didn't have the five weeks to set the SharePoint server up. You know? SharePoint Online is just right there. The Dell stuff looks fascinating. So I think in the end analysis, if you look at who's got the best balanced across the board, oh, and, and, and the Azure stack that came out, I never thought they'd do that. I have talked to Rasinovich about that a half a million times. I said to him, people are not, people love the idea of Azure, but there's a lot of people that are never going to put them on your hardware. And I'm sure there's things higher up, you know, it's not his opinion he's giving, giving me, but I've, I've never, never imagined it would be possible. And, and here they're giving them people the actual code. It'd be interesting to find out how many machines you need to run your own Azure, you know. If it's under 1,000, that'll be fun. You know, so. Anyway, because they've got the, the roundest offering, they could be the big dogs. They could be the big dogs in the cloud. Amazon has invested $12 billion in equipment for their cloud. Microsoft has invested $16 billion, which is interesting. I guess that means there's a lot of servers on Azure, you know, spinning their wheels at the moment. But lots of capacity there. I, I, I think they're, they're poised for success. You should be, th be sure to think about that when you are going to the cloud. Okay? Anyway, so you got a Microsoft-based cloud. So good, that's, that's another reason for people to pay Microsoft money, and that's the, why they're in business. Now, what inhabits the cloud? Well, what inhabits the cloud is not a largely Microsoft, a huge Microsoft population. Yes, there'll be many Windows desktops and, and laptops relatively. They're never going to go away altogether. But of the tablets, I, I have friends who have Surfaces. I have a Surface 2 I enjoy a lot. They're great, but they're, they just, you know, I don't think they're going to win. And Windows phones, I love my Windows phone. It's never going to win. So if you have an infrastructure that is then populated, and the denizens of that infrastructure are non-Microsoft folks, 
That makes a nice business, business model. That's A, that's phase one. That's the first five years. After that, you know and I know that connectivity to the, the Microsoft Cloud is going to be at least a little bit better if you're on a Windows phone. Or just a little bit better if you're on a Surface. Or just a little bit better if you're on some Windows running laptop. I don't know if that's truth. That's not Microsoft saying that. That's my, that's, that's my guess. So that's just my take. So let's talk about applications in the store. So the first thing we talk about, I, I asked you before, you're not using Metro apps? Seriously? Um, universal apps. Microsoft started talking about this in Windows 8, but it's moving forward. Here's the idea. The Xbox is a platform. The, window, uh, the Windows phone is a platform. Uh, Windows, as you know, is a platform. RT, which is apparently dead, unfortunately, uh, is a platform. They want to be able to write one piece of code and move it across all those platforms. They've been doing something like that with NT for a long time. If you remember, NT in the late 90s supported about four processors. Didn't it have PowerPC at one point and Alpha, 32-bit uh, Pentium, 64-bit Pentium. There were some others as well. I can't think of what, what MIPS, the MIPS processor. But that was one thing. Those are all powerful processors. This is a wide variety of processors. The processor in my Windows phone is it's, it's a toy compared to the one that you've got in any of your servers or in any of your desktops. Nevertheless, they've, they've managed to figure out how to run a credible version of Windows on a phone, on the regular old Snapdragon processors. RT's dead, of course, because Intel's done a lot of things with the Atom. But it means it may be really possible to build apps that, that work on everything. You saw Joe Belfiore say that this is running the same code on all these machines. So. And has anybody here played with the Office 16 beta yet? Some really nice stuff in there, right? Some really, really interesting stuff. So. And it does look good on, the, on, on the, the small browsers. So lots of good news. There's just one, more, one store that's for the Xbox, and that's, that's for, the, for the, X phone, the Xbox, the Windows phone uh, and, and Windows. As I'm going to talk to you about, uh, desktop applications now go in the store as well. That's going to be important. Purchasing store apps, very few of you raised your hands, so I'll give you the backstory on this. The backstory on this was, if you rolled out Windows 8, and you wanted those tablet apps, those, those modern apps, the ones that you can do with a finger. You had to pay for them with a Microsoft ID, which means I'm working for Exxon or something, some large organization with lots of security, and they're like, you're not logging on it with anything but an Exxon credential. But no, if I want to be able to get my line of business, uh, modern apps, I've got to log in with my Hotmail account, which, you can, as you can imagine, didn't thrill large organizations for some reason. Also, I had to have to have, I, as, as an employee, I have to have a credit card to pay for these things. It's very small scale stuff. It was just crazy. So purchasing apps are absolutely more flexible to solve that, that problem. Also, there's that whole issue that many of us are bringing our own devices to work and we want to be able to do things. So we want to be able to say, here's an application that runs, but there's a corporate application and there's a personal application. Okay, so the store understands that now. Uh, additionally, it really wasn't easy. If, Let's say that you wanted, I don't know, everybody in your company to have Angry Birds or something like that. Going and buying 30,000 copies of it wasn't easy. You sort of had to have a credit card and you'd be paying person by person by person. It was a real Mickey Mouse operation. Well, now we've got licenses, they can be shuffled around and so on. Additionally, de deploying, deploying store apps was, was the biggest pain. The security model of Windows Store apps, of modern apps, is like this. I'm the administrator, I'm rolling the machine out to you, but I can't install any applications. You have to install them. There are ways I can make it easy for you, but you can see it's a bit cumbersome. There were things you could do, provisioning to make it easier, but it never really was particularly easy. It's fixed now. So to find apps, first of all, uh, the situation is that if you're working with modern apps, and I realize the minority of you are, we're here to talk about Windows 10, Windows 10 is all about the apps. And so you'll be using more modern apps. That's the first thing. Right now, if you go to the Windows Store, everybody sees everything. You go to the Windows Store, and everybody sees everything. They see the games and the productivity tools and hacker tools, you know, whatever other things are in the store. To this point, you've only bought modern apps from the store. With the store for Windows 10, though, desktop apps as well. What's Microsoft trying to do? They're trying to say there's one conduit that you bring software into the, into the system by. By the way, you can have your line of business stuff, but the, the point is that they're trying 
to give you one location where it's easy to acquire and manage applications. You can, however, do something called the Business, Software, Business Store Portal, the BSP. And this is important, because the good news is I'm going to tell you about something that doesn't need System Center, doesn't need an MDM. It's just free. You're going to go to, don't, don't go there now, there's nothing yet, but you can go to business, business software store dot, I, I have the URL here in a minute, it's business store dot Microsoft dot com or some, something like that. You log in with your Azure AD account and you say, when my guys get on, I don't want them to see the games group. I don't want them to see the following apps. I could even say, I only want them to see the following three apps. You can also add in homegrown stuff, your line of business applications. So the Windows Store experience that people have already, it will look very much like that. Except, they're not going to see everything. They're just going to see what you want them to see. And again, you can add in your own line of business applications. I'll talk about the specifics more of this on Friday if you come to the scenarios talk. You don't need System Center, you don't need Intune. It's all web-based. So at its baseline level, everybody can get the benefit of this doing nothing but having Windows 10 licenses. Make sense? There it is, businessstore.microsoft.com at the moment. If you go there, it'll, it, it won't work. So. so that's seeing them. How do we deliver them? If you use Config Manager or Intune, you can put these things into a company store. There is also a thing called the company store, which you don't need System Center for. It's on CodePlex that will do similar things for you. It then grabs an AppX file. You should know that name. That's a Windows 8 concept, but if you've been avoiding modern apps, you wouldn't know this. An AppX file is a package. It's actually not even a package. What it is, is it's a, it's a something.appx is the file. If you change its extension from AppX to zip, you see that it has a folder with a number of machine, no, excuse me, a number of files in it, and is digitally signed. It's all built to be sandboxed. Not only sandboxed, but there is a digital hash for every 64K block of data in that application. Why is that important? It means that if an application becomes corrupted, your system can discover it very quickly, and it only has to pull down 64K to fix it. It's a lot of nice things in, in the app stores. Anyway, so AppX files have been, been around for, for a while. The problem's always been, though, that you can't get them. They get downloaded directly to your system. If you want to buy 3,000 copies of some productivity app, though, you want to have a copy for yourself, and you can now do that. Again, you can take your LOB apps, and you can put them into your company store as well. You can even pre-install apps. This is what we've been doing for years, right? We inject them into images. And what tools do we use? These are familiar tools, tools you already know. DISM, all the MDT tools, Config Manager, if you use Config Manager. There are some new PowerShell commands. There is a new, new noun in PowerShell, AppX volume. That points to a register, that, that points to a folder that's got a whole bunch of modern apps. AppX volume. If you do get dash AppX volume, it will show you where in program files is the default place where you have your modern apps now. So if you're running Windows 8, 8.1, or Windows 10, you're going to have a handful of modern apps, whether you like them, whether you want them or not. You'll have sports, you'll have food and drink, you'll have f health and fitness, all those guys. Okay. Config Manager will be supporting this apparently fairly quickly. I'm not a Config Manager guy, but I'm told that... Um, that there is a, there's some updates coming, and then and there will be a, a, yet another update in 2016. You can also have an app in there at sysprepped. That didn't work so well before. And the way this all works is there's this, ep, there's this second step that closes the loop, that makes it possible for you to roll out, makes it possible for you to roll out 30,000 copies of some app, even if you've only paid for 3,000 licenses, and not rip off the vendor. You got the 30,000 sitting on the people's machines, but the first time they go to use it, it goes out to the license server, and the license server either says, you've, ex you, you've been blocked, you could do that, or you could say, you don't have enough licenses, or okay, 
there's an extra license, but that's going to be in the invoice at the end of the month, stuff like that. This is all centrally controlled with policies. Are there Intune kinds of stuff, MDM kinds of stuff? Uh, there's not, it's not group policy for, as far as I can see. It's, it's system centered stuff. In the long run, if you need to, you can always do something called deep links. Again, I apologize. I know most of you aren't using Windows 8, so this is a new phrase for you. Let me just tell you. One way for me to send you an email to say, install this app, is when you go to the store, you go to the icons, you go to, go to the page where it tells you about the app, and you can right-click and save it. It's an URL. It's a URL. It's about this long. They're called deep links. Even if you don't have the store open, if I send you an email with one of those links, then that will open the store, take you, and download, download the app. So that's, those things are still possible. So lots of deployment methods here. Lots of, lots of things we can, we can look to for deployment. How about paying for them? I've kind of touched on this, but... So the, the business store portal and the store itself. This is a big, big step forward you can get rid of the Microsoft identities. No more, no more working at Exxon and logging into Windows 8 with your Hotmail account. The store will recognize two identities for you. You can have an MSA, a Microsoft account, Hotmail account or something like that, and you can use that to buy your personal apps. Because there's a general notion there in the store that you have apps that are yours apps and apps that are the companies. And why is that important? Because the apps that are in the companies have their own storage areas, which are what? Encrypted, protected. And what does that enable us to do? It means you've got a tablet. It's your tablet. You have our line of business applications on it. You've got your data on it. But then you leave. Now, prior to basically server 2012 R2, our only choice as an organization would be to have something on your, on your tablet that allowed us to wipe the whole tablet. That wouldn't be a good answer. But because we've got two universes on the tablet, because there are two universes on any Windows 10 system with the new store, it becomes possible for someone from a central, or, central organization to push a button and blow up, blow up your corporate apps and blow up all the data from your corporate apps. Blow up just means they were encrypted anyway. It just wipes the key which instantaneously, wipe, uh, instantaneously uh, wipes them, essentially. Does that make sense? As I mentioned, you can buy applications in bulk. That works as well. Organizations can use purchase orders, credit cards, whatever. Write them invoices at the end of the month. So basically what, what, basically what they're doing here is what they should have done with the store when they first got started. And, I, and as I said, in this, in this model, from the BSP, the Business Store Portal, if you go buy 100 copies of Evernote, that's the example Microsoft uses, is Evernote, uh, you could download the Apex for Evernote and start deploying it yourself. So, I realize many of you haven't done this yet, but is this making sense so far? Any questions? How much does Microsoft support Evernote? <laughs> as much as they support Adobe? <laughs> you know, it's an interesting thing. I was at a talk yesterday where they said that Spartan comes with Flash in it. I'm like, hmm, that's interesting. You know, I had heard that there was going to be a big announcement about updates, and you heard, was it Terry Meyerson uh, yesterday morning, did the updates about the, the, the Windows business update, something like that. I was hoping Microsoft would unify all the update models. That would be really nice. If I didn't have to have an Adobe updater, that would make me very happy. So, so uh, Windows Store is an application and it's a service. It works a little bit differently here. Let me tell you about that as well. Um, most folks who are doing Windows 8.1 are unhappy with modern apps. They don't see where it fits in. The whole MSA thing bothers them, and they've disabled the store altogether, which is quite easy to do. You can use AppLocker to do it. There's another group policy that'll do it, and so on. With Windows 10, though, you can, you can sort of, first of all, Windows 10 sets things up so that the modern apps, the store apps, get automatically updated, unless you object to that. These are sandboxed apps, so typically it's not a security issue. It's typically, typically it's just a bug. It's something you want fixed anyway. It's handled by the store service. Now, the store is not only an application, it's a service, and the name of that service is WS Service. It is possible with Windows 10 to disable the store 
Because you don't want people looking in the store. You just want to give them the applications. But keep the service running, which means that they still get the automatic updates. Some of you will say, I don't care if the application is sandboxed. I want to be able to say when, when they get the updates. That's, that's a perfectly reasonable for any, thing for anyone to say. And you can do that as well. There's, there's policies for that. Desktop apps are also in the store. And again, the benefit there is going to be we really, 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 I mean, Microsoft, not we, I don't work for them, but Microsoft really, really, really wants a world where you can push down the volume control and the power button, turn your PC laptop on, and it pff, wipes itself stupid. You then connect it to the cloud, walk away for 30 minutes, you come back, and it's all been nice, nice, nice freshly rebuilt. The problem is, in the, currently, that's only the modern apps. I don't really have any modern apps that I use. The modern app I use the most is probably news. It's, a nice, it's nicely formatted, it's attractive, but you know, I'm not, I don't use a lot of that stuff. They're trying to get desktop apps into there as well, to move towards a world where you can not only be rolling out the modern apps automatically, but the desktop apps as well. So let's talk about desktop apps because they are relevant to all of you. You know how much fun it is to roll out an application? Do a silent install of an application? It's getting better. But if I were to say to you, how, how much time are you going to have to spend so that you could, you could just give me a new PC, turn the machine on, wait 15 minutes, wait 30 minutes, come back, and everything is deployed properly? What's going to be the hard part? It's not the operating system. The operating system is simple nowadays. All you need is an unattend.xml. takes a little while to build it. A couple of you know, specific items you could put into a run first command or something, but it's the apps are the problem. Everybody's got that problem. On the Linux side, they have the same issue. Red Hat Linux created an app packager. And the basic idea was that it did a number of things, you know. They're one-line installs. One-line command line installs. Hands-off installs, silent installs. Repairs as well. And Windows has had them. Anybody remember MSI files? They came out in Windows 2000. They were supposed to be the packaging. It didn't turn out. It's a shame. It would have been nice if they had. There's some others you might not have heard of, but I've come across them. Well, PowerShell 5 and Windows 10 introduced something called OneGet. Here's the package, ma package manager story. We know that we run setup.exe or install.exe. In the Linux world, it doesn't work that way. I shouldn't say the Linux world. In the open software world, which is open source world, which is most of where Linux apps come from, you actually download the source code and you compile it, which is weird for us. Bear in mind, though, that that's a pain. I mean, at least installing an install.exe, at least running an install.exe, gets you some kind of benefit within a few minutes. Compiling a big app can take quite a while. So in the Linux world, they created these things called repositories. You see, because it's one thing to say we have open source, but if it, I'm a particular application, well, the Ubuntu implementation may be different from the Red Hat one. And so each of the implementations, each, each of the, um, uh, what are they? What's the word? D distributions. Each of the distributions will have their own so software repositories, folders of files that can be quickly downloaded and compiled on, uh, on demand. They're also updated. One of the things they do is that as long as they're going to build the compiling tool, they do the updating tool as well. So typically when something is built on a packager, we start to get that benefit that I talked to you about with modern apps, whereby if there is some kind of error, if there is some kind of bug, that can be fixed automatically and quietly. It also means it's a central packaging tool that does all of that, instead of having to run the Adobe updater. Do you ever wonder sometimes if Adobe's gone out of business because it's been like two hours since the updater said it has something? <laughs> something? I'm worried about those guys, you know? <laughs> or the Java updater, too. That one's just... Uh, uh. System modal dialog boxes. So in the Windows world, um, sorry. Now in the Windows world, we don't uh, think too much about that, right? We don't compile our apps. Devs do, though. And devs have the same kind of problems that the Linux folks have. Because if I'm building something in Visual Studio, I'm almost certainly not just using Microsoft stuff. There'll be third-party libraries I'm compiling, other things I need to add in, I've got to keep everything up to snuff. And so in 2010, Microsoft came out with something that's in Visual Studio called NuGet. Anybody heard of it? 
Devs love it. IT pros have never heard of it. One of the interesting things about NuGet is that it allowed devs to rebuild their Visual Studio builds very easily using guess what tool? PowerShell. All of a sudden, the devs discovered that we had a cool tool that we weren't using and they decided to use it. So if we look at NuGet, NuGet's job typically is, I've got a bunch of C-sharp, I've got some JavaScript libraries, blah, 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 blah. It keeps it all in one place for me. But still, what it really does is what? It delivers some files, runs, runs a, few, a few commands. Some people thought, you know, that would make a great Windows package manager. And so I've forgotten the fellow's name, but he started something called Chocolatey. Org. I wish he'd change it because typing chocolatey is a pain in the ass. And, and the reason he called it chocolatey is that the package manager is NuGet and everyone loves chocolatey NuGet. <laughs> this is an open source project. And you know what the problem with open source projects is? Eventually the creator gets a girlfriend. Now, these packages tend to be pretty simple. It's an install slash s or something along those lines. But you access the packet, packet through a, a gallery. So this is a cool idea. The idea is this is all decentralized. Anyone can set up a chocolatey gallery. There is a, there's a central one that chocolatey.org uh, runs. Now, there's been other package managers. Well, the PowerShell guys looked at that and they said, you know what? We, we can do better. There's lots of package managers out there. We love chocolatey, but let's... This is going to be one of those things where things are changing quickly. So they're creating a pack, they created a package manager, package manager for package manager. It's kind of a meta package ma manager. And the notion is it does pretty much everything that package managers do, except it needs a specific little plug-in for every particular package. It's called one get, PowerShell's the only way to do it. In the PowerShell world, the nouns are package, package provider, and package source. It would need a separate plug-in for every kind of package manager Chocolatey's built in. And the PowerShell guys are talking now about creating a central repository for the installers, which would be pretty neat, you know? Chocolatey's in there, out of the box. And I, I, look, I know some of you hate when I put PowerShell up. This is the only slide I'm going to do with PowerShell, I think. To add a provider, suppose Chocolatey were not in there, okay? Registered dash, dash package source dash name chocolatey dash provider name okay that's got some kind of name and then this location is a url that's already in the box uh excuse me i'm sorry that is not windows 10 doesn't seem to have this in the box that, is that what it is Right, so, so, oh, okay, so, so, so the, yeah, the module name used to be called, called one get, now it's called package manager. But I, I, I know that, but it, when I did a get dash whatever, it didn't work. I had to re-register chocolatey to make it work in Windows 10. Okay. Yeah, yeah, the latest one, the, the one you guys just did. I might have screwed up. It's entirely possible. It happens a lot. So... <laughs> That command, if you have the same problem that I do, that command, no, please talk to me later. Okay, please, please, I want to hear you. Um, find dash package, show you everything it has. And the chocolate has got 2,684 when I looked at it three days ago. Install, install dash package VLC, that puts VLC on your computer, just like that. It's neat stuff. If you're not doing it, start thinking about it. Even if you're not doing Windows 10 because you want to hear the good part, the good part is that when you, when you install PowerShell 5, it's, not, it's built into Windows 10, but you can download it and install it, and you get a whole bunch of things. You get zip file support. So if you're PowerShell and you'll like this, you can build zip files and you can, you can pull things out of them, that sort of thing. Convert from string is really, really, really cool, but you've got to be a geek to understand it. The notion is it's going to take a file and it's going to make objects out of it. It's a super, super parser, which is just great, great stuff. Uh, more on event tracking. There's an encryption. I don't know much about this, but CMS messages, I haven't looked at that, but people who hear about it are excited about it. Uh, the, the items, get dash item, new dash item, all those guys can now do symbolic links. And here's the total, totally groovy part. It's all in PowerShell 5. If you download PowerShell 5 to your Windows 7 machine, if you do it to your Windows 8.1 machine, 
you will have all that package manager stuff that I just showed you. So I'm, I'm begging you, I'm pleading with you. This is going to be big. The package manager stuff is going to be big. So please, please, please um, take a moment. Okay. Um, another thing I like about PowerShell is that I can go and look in the commands. And if I find a noun I don't recognize, that gives me a clue about what Microsoft hasn't told us yet about Windows 10. I found a few of them. One is file share. Is this a new file sharing client or something like that? I haven't heard this new file share sharing server, so that'll be interesting. A lot of protocol details in that one. Looks cool. It basically, I guess it means I'll have to stop using net use. <laughs> it's been 25 years. I don't know if I can separate. <laughs> PNP device. There's now PowerShell commands that will let you register a particular, you get information about particular uh, plug and play devices. You can unregister them and all that kind of stuff. Disable from the command line. Don't know why I need it, but I'm sure I will one day. And AppX volume, which I already mentioned, that one is involved with deploying as well. One more tool. It's a management tool. Check this got a big change in Windows 8.1. Anybody hear about this? Why does no one know this? Any of you run servers? Anybody run servers as part of your job? Do you ever have that moment where you reboot the server and you're expecting to take three minutes? Now, the corner of your eye, the screen is the wrong color. It's kind of a tan kind of, you know, color, sort of a mocha. And the numbers are counting down. There's numbers going 25, 24, 23. And you say, whoa, 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 you haven't had your coffee yet, but you know. <laughs> Check this because it's going to start running on drive D and your exchange server is going to be offline for 34 hours. <laughs> That's the moment when you go, no! <laughs> and the reason is, when CheckDisk, like before Windows 8, before Windows 8.1, CheckDisk notices there's something wrong. Like some, some, some I.O. operation fails and it says, I can't do anything with this because I'd have to unmount the C drive and that's the beginning of a bad day at the office, you know? So all it does is it leaves a note for itself that says, hey, the C drive screwed up. So it wakes up, first thing in the morning, it's like, C drive screwed up. Mother, that's bad. <laughs> I'm just going to have to scan me a drive. And if you don't catch the 25 second count, the 30 second countdown, it does that. Well, Windows 8 had this amazing brain idea. There's now a file called dollar sign corrupt. You can't see it inside your, your drives. And when somebody discovers there's a problem, it says, C drive's got a problem. This is the exact cluster. So now on Windows 8.1, server 2012 R2 or later or whatever, when you reboot, Texas wakes up, hey, oh man, C drive's got a problem exactly at this cluster. Hang on. Okay, done. Now you can boot. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> I mean, basically, I just... You can now, when you see the countdown, say, screw it, do it now, you know? And if you like, you can even look at dollar sign corrupt and dollar sign verify with uh, the file... There's a command line tool that, 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 that does that. So before you even did it, you could see there's only three things it's checking. Anyway, they've gotten even better, though. The UI on CheckDisk has gotten even better. So, uh, with that, uh, thank you, and uh, I hope that I taught you guys some new things in Windows 10. This is an overview session, so I hope I didn't get too geeky. Um, I'm going to, Rasinovich and I do this thing that we've been doing for the last few years, the Mark and Mark show, where I'm going to talk about how bad the cloud is, and he's going to say, no, I'm a fool. And it's always fun, so if you can, join us 315 at Airy Crown. Um, I'm also emceeing an Anything You Want to Ask session with Jeremy Muskets, Sammy Leo, and the whole Windows team, I'm told. And I'm doing a scenarios talk on Friday. Thank you for coming. Remember to use this knowledge for good.